Hello and welcome to Early Childhood Ireland's podcast. Our podcast features interviews and discussions on all issues relating to quality early learning and care with a range of speakers who are leaders in the areas that matter to Early Childhood Ireland members. I'm Maura Corbett and I work with Early Childhood Ireland. In this episode, I'm really delighted to be chatting with Laura Lundy and Anne O'Donnell, who both worked on the development of the National Framework for Children and Young People's Participation in Decision Making. As a consultant manager of Hubna Noog, the Department of Children, Equality, Disability, Integration and Youth National Centre of Excellence on giving children and young people a voice in decision making in Ireland, Anne O'Donnell led on the collaborative development of the National Participation Framework. She was formerly head of the Citizen Participation Unit in the Department of Children and Youth Affairs, and she oversaw the development of the National Strategy on Children and Young People's Participation in Decision Making. Professor Laura Lundy is a co-director of the Centre for Children's Rights and a professor of education uh, law and children's rights in the School of Social Sciences at Queen's University, Belfast. So you're really welcome, Laura, and it's a pleasure to talk to, to both of you. Thanks, Maria. Thank you. So, and maybe I'll come to you first. Can you take us through the background to the development of the National Framework for Children and Young People's Participation in Decision Making and the yeah. checklists that accompany it? Yes. Um, so thanks for that, Maura. Um, so over many years, uh, the years that the Department of Children uh, was working on in the whole area of children's children and young people's participation and decision making, it became clear that there was kind of confusion out there and maybe a lot of stakeholders didn't fully understand what participation was and maybe how to exactly do it. That became more evident after the establishment of Hub Nanog as a centre of excellence. And for the last four years in Hub Nanog, we've conducted a huge amount of training of statutory and other organisations. And through that process, a lot of issues have become obvious. So key issues include that stakeholders struggle in using a rights-based approach to involving children and young people in decision-making. And uh, interestingly, they often struggle to involve them in decisions in their everyday services and activities. So that led us to realize that there was a need for a national guidance of some kind. And the department and hub approached Professor Laura Lundy and asked her if she would work with us on the development of a national framework. So it's been my great pleasure to work with Laura for the last few years. And it's just been a fantastic journey. Uh, culminating in the framework. So the process of developing the framework was very collaborative, starting off with bringing Laura in and developing early drafts. And then we were very lucky to have the wisdom of a network of practice, um, which includes Early Childhood Ireland. So a lot of organisations all around Ireland are involved in our hub network of practice. And we brought all the early drafts to them and they gave us really good feedback and indeed, it was the network of practice who suggested that we needed something that really met the needs of practitioners in early years, in schools, in youth clubs, in hospitals, where they meet children in everyday settings. So we do, of course, and we have it in the framework, need something that supports decision makers where they're developing policy and practice and other kinds of higher level initiatives. But it reminded us that practitioners, that kind of checklist doesn't work for them. So early on, we decided that the entire framework would be based on the Lundy model, grounded in the Convention of the Rights of the Child and the Convention of the Rights of People with Disabilities, and obviously in the National Participation Strategy. We worked with many, many stakeholders across government, uh, got feedback from all government departments and agencies, feedback from many, many non-government organizations. They provided very detailed written feedback. They user tested our planning checklist. And Laura and myself painstakingly went through all the feedback and took an awful lot of it on board. And then we got to a very exciting part of the process, which was uh, conducting focus groups with practitioners around the everyday spaces checklist. And so I conducted focus, group with, focus groups with a wide number of practitioners including early years practitioners. That was an amazing part of the process. 
and they gave us wisdom that we never would have had ourselves. And we brought it all together along with the feedback we've had from the hub training and it eventually became the participation framework. So do you want me to take you through the checklists or maybe that's something that I could refer to later on? Maybe if we take that later on, because yeah. as part of sign, we can sign post listeners to the further resources that are that are available. Exactly. Is that okay? So yeah, you can make a note of that, Anne, and we'll uh, we'll come back to it later. So, and you kind of mentioned there a little bit about um, you know keeping it real, keeping it uh, practice based, and supporting practitioners to. Um, uh, see participation as something that the very young children could be involved in. But yes, sometimes I suppose we see children as vulnerable and unable to express opinions and mm -hmm. or their opinions aren't taken seriously. Uh, Laura, what are your thoughts on how we can have a more positive image of children under six and uh, their competencies? How can we yeah. I suppose develop our own understanding of participation and, and how we support and enable this with very young children. Yeah, I mean, Anne started on it, I think, that the, saying that the framework is about rights. And if you see every child as a, as a rights holder, then you start to see them as, as not just competent, but, you know, constantly expressing themselves and, and able to influence decisions in their own lives, even from a very, very young age. So that, that's my starting point, is that every child has these rights. The rights are not age limited and the right to be heard is not age limited. It's it's given to every child who's capable of um, expressing a view. And what you have to do when you look at that is think, well, how do we express a view? And you've got to, in some stage cases, go beyond spoken language or, or written language. And actually every child is communicating from birth. Every child's communicating something through their mood, whether they're crying, whether they're happy, then early language, body language. And um, so not always orally. And if you see that, then you realize every child is capable of expressing themselves, you know, what they, what they like, what they don't like, what they want, what suits them. And then the obligation is to, get, to take that seriously and to respond to that. Now that response is limited by age and maturity. So there are some things that maybe very young children might want that might not be good for them and that you might not be able to have, <clears throat> but, but you still have to seek their views. You still have to act in ways that looks like you're, you're wanting to know what is it you want, what suits you. And then when responding to be able to say to them, I know that you really want this, you really want to eat this whole bag of sweets or that massive bar of chocolate, but you can't because you'll make yourself sick. But here, mm. have a little piece of chocolate. You know, it's that type of behavior and that begins at birth. You yeah. know, it's not for later. Yeah, and, and there can be choices like, you know, uh, do you want an apple or an orange? It's not, do you want, you know, absolutely everything that's in the fruit bowl, but that absolutely. you're not making children um, eat something that they don't want to eat. And I, I, I mean, that's crucial. It's just mm. this idea that choice is everything in that. And I mean, it's really, I mean, I feel this podcast is incredibly important because it gets neglected in early childhood. And yet it's so fundamental for the rest of childhood and adulthood that it mm. begins. And it begins in that notion that their views are are, are sought their views are important that they are important and that they can begin to make choices and, and and be guided to make good choices and that's all part of the the right to be heard and I think in those little simple actions you know are you going to wear a coat are you not going to wear a coat are you what do you want to eat what do you want to play with who do you want to play with where, where there's a possibility for autonomy for making mm. independent choices then it's a really really important that it's that it's given yeah, and flagging things that are coming up, like, you know, not swooping your child up when you're changing their nappy, that yeah. you kind of say, you know, I think you need a nappy change, we're going to um, yeah. take you to the nappy changing room shortly and um, make and you that's, all. That's crucial. Try. And that actually fits with, you know, with my model, it's not just about um, the right to be heard. The thing about the Lundy model is, as Anne said, it's a rights-based model and it connects it to other human rights. And one of the, the rights it connects it to is the right to information. <laughs> And actually, you know, you can't make choices without information. So that's a beautiful example you've given of, you know, giving the child information so they understand what's happening to them. You know, mm. so it's, as you say, not scooped up and taken somewhere. And that idea that you're, you're guiding them along. We're going to be doing this. We're going to be doing that, that then. We're going to be doing this is the reason we're doing it, mm. you know, and, and, and what's happening after. That's all really just lovely practice and lovely rights respecting practice. Yeah, yeah. And again, it under, underscores the um, the importance of, of interactions. And I suppose we're, we're lucky here, too, that our curriculum framework starts from that central 
uh, theme of children being competent and, and um, confident, that um, which is respecting them as um, individuals rather than kind of their children. Exactly. I mean, respect is everything about rights, and it's that, that mm. idea of seeing them as a person worthy of respect, and that's the dignity, equality, and respect are the fundamental underpinning of all human rights. And if you see it in that way, and you see a child in that way, mm. then I think everything else should naturally flow. Yeah, absolutely. And do you want to add something there? I mean, not really, because I think Laura has really covered it very, very well. Um, and I suppose it is really very important um, that that adult stakeholders and decision makers accept the fact that even, even if they don't believe in it, children have these rights. So I think there, you know, it, of course it makes for better services and a better environment that say, for example, in an early year setting, if you listen to children and really hear what they have to say and take their views on board, you know, you're going to end up in, in a situation where what you do with children uh, is more enjoyable for them. It's what they want to do. It's what they enjoy doing. But even for adult decision makers who may not uh, be motivated to believe that you will get a better outcome, they probably need, they do need to know that children have these rights and that the Committee on the Rights of the Child has been very clear that you, as a state party, you cannot put an age limit on giving children a right to a voice. There, it, that's a really critical part of their general comment 12. So I would, in my in the training that we deliver, we use very much a carrot and a stick approach. So the carrot is, you know, it, it, it's better for children, it's better for you, it's better for society. But the stick is, you have an obligation. We are a state party that has ratified the convention and we have to give children this respect and rights are not up for discussion. Rights are not optional. They are rights and, and the, the, they are human rights and these children have those rights. I think that that point is, is really, you know, really, really important that it's not something that starts at, you know, age three or age 13 or whatever that, uh, you know, from birth children have, have rights. It's um, a point, point well made. So, um, Laura, I was at a conference in, in Cork a couple of years ago where you I remember being very, I suppose, reassured that, um, you know, doing something was better than doing nothing. You took us through the, the, the model. And then when I remember being on my way home and kind of thinking, you know, that's great. You know, it's great thinking that doing something is better than doing nothing. But I suppose there can be a danger sometimes that you kind of become a bit complacent there and saying, well, mm -hmm. you know, at least I'm doing something. So, you know, how do you suggest that we can, you know, challenge ourselves, I suppose, to move from being kind of tokenistic Mm -hmm. to um, uh, participation being just ingrained in, um, in the yeah. way we do things, um, giving feedback on their views, what we can do with their views um, and how their views can influence the decision making process. What are your suggestions on, on that? I suppose just to clarify that point, and I make it often, is about children when you consult them as a group. I say doing something's better than doing nothing because I, I got very worried that this idea of tokenism was stopping people doing anything at all. So people were saying, I won't talk to children because it would be tokenistic. And I was really trying to say that's actually wrong. It's a, back to our, the point made earlier. It's not optional, you know, You're, you have to talk to them and you've got to do the best you can. But that's only for collective participation. That's whenever we consult children as, as a group. And the national framework is really good on that, are really good at making the distinction and showing the tools um, for, for individual decision making and for children as a group. So it's, so, so it's only about that. When you're talking about the okay. decisions that affect an individual child, there's no scope for tokenism. You know, that's their entitlement and you can't be tokenistic. You've just got to, you can't say you can't have time or resource to talk to an individual child, you know, in an early childhood setting. That's just not, that's not an option. But, but I think also in early childhood settings, I just, I, I haven't seen as much practice in that where you get children as a group you know to, to to look at policies to to look together to talk you know and I obviously you know with, it's harder with babies and toddlers but with three and four year olds there is no reason you couldn't get them in a group to give guidance back on an early childhood setting policy on whatever it is playtime or food or choices so again I think that's where I think 
doing something's better than doing nothing. So how do you make it better than that? I, I, in my work, I've really emphasized that's an attitude. So it's, you're not going in to be tokenistic to tick the box. You're going in to do your best and your best is gather the views and take them seriously. That, asking no more than that and then feeding back to them. And what I find in, in, in our research is that when people do that, when they dip their toe in that water, uh, they'll get some things wrong because we always do, but they'll learn and actually just begin to improve your practice by trying it out, seeing what works. So, Anne, did you want to add something to Laura's point about uh, tokenism? Yeah, I mean, I, I found Laura's article very, very interesting. And I would agree that there are circumstances where doing something is way better than doing nothing. And that's particularly been the case during COVID, where it's been really challenging and difficult to find ways of hearing children and young people, but to hit particularly younger children, because you can't do that online. Uh, you know, it's not appropriate. It doesn't work. You can get groups of teenagers online and consult with them, but there's all kinds of safeguarding issues and other issues around getting ch younger children under 12 online. And, um, you know, some of them, for example, we recently uh, did a consultation or oversaw the conduction of a consultation with children on the Convention on the Rights of the Child, which will inform Ireland's report uh, to, to the UN Committee. And we did it in the end because with teenagers, it was possible to do it online. With younger children, we couldn't meet up with them. But we get, set up a group of teachers, primary school teachers, who, who had been in connect, contact with us through training and different initiatives. And we ended up doing a phenomenal process where we got, I think, we put a lot of work into getting schools with a very different kind of schools, with kids with disadvantage, kids with learning difficulties, kids, uh, schools with autism units, uh, etc., and in the end, we got about 22 schools and we've got and we, and we sent this gorgeous hard copy uh, little questionnaire to children, uh, which they could be, get help from the teachers in the, in the junior infant and senior infant classes. And we've just had the most phenomenal response to very simple questions about their rights in child friendly language where the teachers got feedback from children on the design, on the words. And it's going to end up being really, really meaningful. And yet. In the beginning, we looked at it maybe as not the best practice that we might ever have done, but it's actually emerging to be so amazing what's come back from it. So it just proves that sometimes, you know, and a lot of times, it's definitely better to do something than to do nothing. I suppose it's one of the, the pluses of COVID is that it has made us more creative and think outside the box in, in, in some ways and has been the impetus to us trying things that maybe yeah. we would have held off trying before in case they didn't work. So um, will, will that report be available somewhere in or is it? Oh, uh, it'll become part of the report that Ireland uh, will submit to the okay. uh, Committee on the Rights of Child. Yeah, yeah it sounds sounds great I look forward to, to seeing it you know it sounds really innovative um so Laura I'll come back to you uh, at a conference in Limerick a colleague of mine um heard you speaking about the fact that there's been uh, you know in terms of children's rights there's been an emphasis on access um to services as being the main rights focus um rather than maybe the right to a quality service. Um, can you take us through that a, a, a little and um, maybe outline if there are steps we can take to make sure that the right to a quality service is seen as being as important as access? Um, you know, does should yeah. participation be considered a, a key aspect of, of quality in um, early year services? Yeah, and I mean, I, I, yes, I, I mean, obviously, I agree. I made the point, and, and, what, and it really connects to everything we've been talking about, and that is, you know, it's not just about access to something. A rights based approach to any service will have certain features. Um, and there are other features beyond participation that decisions should be made in the best interest of children, for instance. Um, but this one that we're talking about now on participation, it should be core to developing a quality service because you can't develop a quality service without um, engaging with users. And this is any service. And it's no different for early childhood services that you want to be engaging with the users who are young children. Not, and not just in the everyday spaces, but in design. So hearing from what's important, what's significant, what they can look like, that's crucial to a quality service. And then to pick up on the second uh, you know, half of your question, which I, I think 
is what you're saying is how do we define a quality service? You know, and there should be standards and there are standards for early childhood services, but one of those standards should clearly be around that children's views are sought and taken into account. And whenever those services are assessed or evaluated or when they're self-evaluating, that should be a core dimension of that. And that comes from that fundamental understanding that this is a right in itself, that it's right to be heard, but it's also crucially a way of delivering other rights and in this case they should be delivering the child's right to development to play to learn to socialize their all rights as well and they're delivered through engaging children's own views on that yeah in uh, shield is the uh quality framework here and it is the first standard is the rights of the child but you know it's uh, the the educators find it hard to find practical examples when they're maybe writing up their shield for the quality assurance uh, process, which is coming to an end. It can be something that can be hard to describe because they believe in children's rights, but believing it and encouraging participation can sometimes be, you know, seen as two, two different things because of the, which harks back to the first question because of the young age of the children um, and, and that image of the child. It often kind of just goes back to that image of the, the child. And, Can I um, give you a little example because sure. it's coming to my head. I have a, a master's student in Donegal in an early childhood centre and for her master's dissertation she designed um, quality standards around the inspection process and she got one of the, the ETI inspectors of early childhood services in Donegal to come in and meet the children and talk to them and then the children created storybooks about what, 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 what they wanted in terms of what, what their ch early childhood work should, care should look like and what the inspectors should be looking at and then a process about how the inspector should talk to them and I, and I know the ETI is looking at this in our, across all ETI work but particularly early childhood as well and I think that could be really significant couldn't it because if it's valued you know in these evaluations then it, it, we hope it would get done. Yeah that, and, and that story reminds me of another one where there was a, an early years inspector in a, a setting that I was working with as a shield a mentor a couple of years ago and uh, the setting used learning journals and um, the children have, are very involved in the creation of the learning journals and uh, have ownership. They're not something that are up on a shelf that are done to make nice looking documentation. They're very much part of the children's day. And this little two year old insisted that the preschool inspector would sit down and go through his learning journal with him. And he was showing her all the things he liked to do and the, the pictures he had drawn and what was in the pictures. And it, it really is very simple things. Sometimes it sounds more grandiose, which can kind of put people off uh, trying. And it, it, it's those simple things like children having ownership in their own, in their own room. It's, uh, it's, uh, that's a lovely example too, Laura. And have you something to add? Well, I mean, I think Laura and yourself both addressed it very comprehensively. But I do think in terms of a quality service or quality activities for children and young people, um, I think the everyday spaces checklist is, will be extremely helpful because it is um, for use by those who work every day with children in an early year setting, in a hospital, in a classroom, in a youth club. And it really basically reminds them to make sure that they really properly give children space, voice, audience and influence every single time they're with them. So the idea would be, hopefully, that in the long term, that we will have posters of, of the everyday spaces checklist and, the, and it's hard to give do justice to it when, when this is on audio uh, without people seeing it. So I really would recommend that they look up the framework on the HUB website. But it asks the practitioner very few, very simple questions under each of space, voice, audience and influence. Like, you know, how am I offering children different ways of giving their views? How am I showing them that I'm ready and willing to listen to them? Because adults can so easily, with their body language, make it clear that they're not really listening. And children know when they're not really listening. So they're very simple questions, but everyone we tested them with, including early years practitioners, loved them. They said they found them very, that they really, really put them in a position of reflecting on their own pra practice. You know, things like, am I giving children enough time? 
and I'm making sure that everyone in the room is being heard. So I think that the everyday spaces checklist would really assist in, you know, much stronger uh, quality of services that are delivered from a rights based perspective. They are beautiful. They're lovely resources. And we will, um, when we're uh, promoting the podcast, we will signpost people to the uh, to the website where they can find them. And uh, yeah, it would be great to have them in poster size because they are, they're very uncluttered, which means that the questions are easy to, um, easy to think about and easy to reflect on. And I'll, I'll come to you next. Um, what's, what do you see as being the difference between participation in learning and participation in decision making? Okay, thanks for asking that question, Maura. Um, this is something I think one of the, one of the I suppose, one of the, the practices that we would have seen over the years that led us to realize that there was serious confusion about what participation in decision making means is that it became clear that for lots of people out there, they think participation means taking part. So taking part in football, taking part in art, taking part in drama, taking part in school. Uh, and it, that is not what we're talking about. We're talking about taking part in decision making in your school, in your football club, in your art session. So a lot of the work that we would have done with practitioners in the early childhood space, it became evident that early years practitioners would be probably as pra the practitioners who best understand participation and decision making because of the Ashter and Shielter frameworks and the way they work. And they are so, so open to hearing what children have to say in, in, the, in their settings. But it did become clear that in a lot of settings, children are participating in their learning but they're not making the decisions about what they learn about and how they learn it. And so, that, so it's not participation in decision-making, it's, it's participation in learning. What participation in decision-making would be, would be the early years practitioner asking the children, what activities do you want to do and how do you want to do them? So it's, it's, it's a different level of engagement and it's really involving, it's that the, the, the practitioner isn't deciding on the activities that the children will do that day. The children are deciding that and they're de deciding on the way they'll engage in them. So it is, it can be seen as a subtle difference, but it's a seriously important difference. And it really will, will eventually lead to a very kind of, I suppose, something that's, that's quite different to enabling and supporting children to participate in learning. I'm sure Laura might have something to say on this as well, but it would be one of the, the key subtle aspects of what is meant in our framework that would make such a huge difference to children feeling that they have a real voice in what happens every day in their, either it's in their classroom or in their early year setting or wherever they are. Uh, so I, I'm sure Laura might have something to say on that as well. And I think you captured it really well. And, and that's why, again, in, in the framework, one of the things that we came up with in our conversations is this new concept of participation with purpose. And I think we're, you know, this idea of participation with purpose, it's done for a reason. And the reason is that children can be influential in their own lives. And we're hoping that that concept helps to, to, to make the difference between taking part and taking part in decision making. So not just taking part in the activity, but actually influencing the nature of the activity and responding to that. And again, that whole notion of choice. So in, in Early Childhood Ireland, and, in, and you said that um, Early Childhood Ireland was involved in the development of the framework, we encourage uh, educators and practitioners to think about um, an emergent inquiry play-based uh, curriculum. So you're following the lead of the, the children. What's explored and investigated is um, coming from the children. So, okay, well, you know, they might be sitting down saying, you know, what would you like to do? The ideas that are being explored are, uh, are coming from the children. Um, does that sound like um, participation and decision-making to you? Does that... Um, that idea, does that fit with what you're saying? It does, but 
I, I, we would, I would have, you know, read quite a number of learning stories and, and different uh, initiatives uh, coming from early childhood at Ireland and from practitioners. And I do think there's still a way to go in some in some of the practice. I think there's still a little, there's still some confusion. Um, and I, I, I'd suggest that there is space for uh, children to have much more of a say maybe than they do. Um, now, you know, I can't comment on what goes on everywhere, but I do think there is definitely, um, I think it's important that people review what they're doing and, and look at it in the context of the framework and, you know, are all the time learning and improving and trying to do it in a more effective way, in a more yeah. right based way. Yeah. Can I add something there? Because I think um, the, the way that you presented sometimes is quite intimidating to practitioners and it's really not walking in and giving children a carte blanche. What do we do today? <laughs> because you have professional staff who have been trained, you know, on early childhood and they know that children will need a you know, varied set of activities in their day and they will need rest and they will need outside exercise and they will need to eat, you know, and be c cared for. So it's really, it's not... To, you know, passing it all over to the children, abdicating responsibility. I think it's perfectly okay to have a day with structure. And I understand that people are working within structures that are resource structures as well, you know, and staffing limitations, restrictions. So there has to be, there are limitations to what's possible, you know, but I think where it's possible in realistic and those moments that it's possible then that the staff should be saying, okay, in, in this next 30 minutes, it's, we're going to be doing messy play and then giving choices within messy play and perhaps reacting to that scene. There's something the children really aren't interested in in that group so then that's something you drop and you find something else that they're really so it's it's that it's not just handing it over to two-year-olds and saying what are you going to do today guys you know it's not it's not like that and I want to give you actually I was just thinking of a really personal example I hope it's okay and to, to do this is, is I was thinking I, I have my eldest son um he's now 26 um he he was in a fantastic um uh, early childhood setting um and he's never slept a day in his life you know he never has never did as a baby my mom couldn't believe it and whenever he went to nursery, that structure of nursery where there's a set time for nap, you know, that they all have nap time. And I understand from a professional perspective, it's when staff get their lunch, you know, in a way. And there are, it, it, it's better at a uniform time because there's you know, fewer people to be around to watch the children and nap times, naps are important for young children, except for my son. And, uh, and I think what was really interesting there was how that nursery handled that. And they did it so well. In a previous nursery, they handled it terribly. They just used to force him to lie there and not speak. So of course, what he tried to do was wake every other child up, you know, as is his way. And, and in the new nursery, uh, we moved to the, the, the early childhood setting and um, they were fabulous. They just realized he, he doesn't sleep. You know, we're not going to make him sleep. He's going to. And so they created an area with a screen and quiet activities for him, you know, so that he could ha he could do what he cho chose to do, which was never going to be sleeping and was never going to be lying still for 30 minutes while the other children. And I think that's it. And they talked to him about what he wanted to have there, what he'd play with quietly and explain to him. Everybody else wants a wee nap, you know. You, we really don't want you waking them up. I think that that's my personal example of and that was right space practice. Yeah, and can I just add, um, uh, Maura, like I completely agree with Laura. Of course, we're, I'm not suggesting, similar to Laura, that, you know, children walk into an earlier setting and just define their own day. It's more about just, I suppose, finding ways to give more and more agency to children at, it, at different times of the day. And again, I understand as an adult and an adult practitioner, whatever you're practicing and when you're meeting up with children and young people, it's kind of quite scary to think there's chunks of the day now that aren't really defined and I don't quite know what's going to happen, but actually that can be very exciting and it can be, you know, and I know for the ways that we would facilitate children and young people when we conduct consultations, that's how we do it. We, we use an open space approach where we have no idea what the kids are going to say they want to talk about. So as facilitators, up until the, the, the children have categorized what they want, put up all their own ideas, created their own categories, we've no idea what topic we're facilitating. And a lot of facilitators struggle with that. But over time, you really get to realize the such it's so exciting and it gives real agency to children and young people and they really value that agency they value seeing we picked these topics and now that's what we're talking about so i think it's in those small 
segments of time throughout the day, uh, as I say, that we're talking about, not about children walking in and, you know, taking over the setting. <laughs> so I just wanted to make sure people don't think that's what we're saying. Yeah. Yeah, I, th I think it takes time sometimes to develop that, you, you know, I think we've come from a place where your planning had to be very, you know, from nine to half nine, we do this from half nine to 10, we do that. And this, um, it takes a little bit of time to trust the process to know that if you if your planning has been about how the environment is set up, and how it supports children um, in their play and hands on learning that you know the the time will be filled and there won't be anarchy and there won't be chaos and that the children will be much more invested and it's to you know uh, keep encouraging educators along along that journey I think it's um, and some people are further on that road than than others like we said earlier there there's some lovely examples there and I suppose the, 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 the final question that we were going to, to discuss, and maybe we've kind of teased it out already, but um, it, it was a line in the framework that struck me. Um, and it says it's important not to get stuck in the process of doing participation, but to ensure that the purpose of involving children and young people in decision making is to give them a voice on day to day activities and practices or the development of projects, programs, services or policies that are central. Um, how do, does that relate to early childhood as a, both as a state and as a, a stage? Maybe, Anne, would you uh, start with that one? Yeah, I mean, and this, this is very much back to what Laura talked about, participation with purpose. Mm. So it's about, we observed a very common practice around Ireland was lots and lots of people, organisations and bodies understood that they need to be doing participation of children. But it, a lot of it was not in decision making. It was the process of doing it. We're, having, we're hearing what the children have to say, but it was going nowhere because they were giving them space, they were giving them voice, but they didn't accept or maybe realize they needed to give due weight. They needed to give audience and influence. And then the opportunity needed to be there for what children were saying to make a real difference, to have an impact, to change something about a service. So there was a lot of process going on, doing it, but it going nowhere. And really, that's why the checklist, both the everyday spaces and the planning checklist for if you're developing a project, a service, whatever, that's why they're so important. Laura, do you want to add to that? Yeah, no, I, th I think just one other thing that I'd like to add that relates to that is, is the quality of the participation itself. And one of the things that I really love in the, in the framework, and I know is getting a lot of attention, people are asking, can they translate it all over the world, is the, um, is the evaluation sheet for children themselves that Anne worked on with children about getting it all on one page. So no matter what you're doing, um, that they can, um, they can ask, the, the, the children who can read can go through it and do it themselves but we both thought about it for early childhood and I've got quite a few questions about it for from early childhood and I think they, they can be read out you know and it can be like a little star system there could be a new version developed for much younger children you know that can be read to them about whether they actually felt they were heard felt they understood what was happening felt they were heard knew where their views were going knew what was going to happen and there was feedback so we haven't talked about feedback and, and just you know, going on from what Anne said, I mean, this is the Lundy model. That is why it got kind of famous. And that is that the emphasis on audience, who are the views going to? Are they the people who can make decisions and, and also influence what is happening? Are they taking it seriously? How are they telling children what happened? And that, that idea of the feedback loop, those are really crucial elements. And that's what distinguishes participation from rights-based participation, from taking part, from taking part with purpose. Great. That's uh, thank you both so much. That was a fascinating conversation. And um, and have you more to add on the, the checklists? I said we'd come back to them and I know you've referred to them a few times, but uh, do you want to say a little bit more before we finish? I, I mean, to be honest, Maura, I think, you know, in the absence of people being able to see them, it's yeah. very difficult to explain them. But I will just say there are two checklists. Uh, well, there's three. There's a planning checklist, uh, all of course based on space, voice, audience, and influence, which, uh, which is for organizations when they're developing policies, services, uh, governance, legislation, research. So it's at that kind of high level. And this it's a checklist that you 
you ask yourself before you embark on engaging children and young people in decision making, you go through a very detailed series of questions asking yourself under space, voice, audience and influence, how are we going to, about, going to go about making sure that the way we involve children and young people is rights-based and meaningful and will really lead to real outcomes? Then the evaluation checklist is the very same questions in the past tense. So how did we do it and did it work? And then I've mentioned the everyday spaces checklist, which is for more everyday settings. So honestly, I think people just need to have a look at them uh, for them to make sense rather than listening to me kind of raving on about them. Um, and I, I, you know, I'll endorse they, 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 they are simple, they're easy to use and, uh, and they look really well. So I would... Um, uh, echo what uh, Anne has said and encourage all of you to check them out and use them. So um, thank you both Anne and Laura for that. Um, oh, it was a really enlightening and inspiring discussion about child participation. Uh, your passion and commitment is just inspiring. Um, I like that you made it clear that every journey kind of starts with a, a single step. So uh, yeah, I, again, I would encourage everyone to check out the tools and begin to reflect on how you can ensure that all the children in your setting have uh, space, voice, audience and influence in their uh, care and education settings. So thank you all for listening to Early Childhood Ireland's podcast. And if you've enjoyed the podcast, please tell your friends and colleagues and uh, we hope you'll join us next time. Mm -hmm.